Greetings everyone and welcome to my review of the GTX 1080. For about 10 months prior to now, I've had the pleasure of having the GTX 980 Ti G1 gaming in my PC. It drove games amazingly well, and it was the first dive into high-end PC gaming as it drove my Acer XB270HU, a 1440p 144Hz monitor, with great ease. However, the 980 Ti was not able to achieve 144fps at 1440p in every game while still maintaining ultra settings. The card, although was brilliant, pairing with my shiny new monitor, did not take full advantage of the full monitor's capabilities, and for this reason, I decided to invest in the brand new GTX 1080. In another video, I'll be putting this card up to battle my goals of 1440p 144fps, but this video is more focused on the card itself and not one area in which it performs. No, in this video, I'll be going over the positives and negatives of the new GPU and what it means for PC enthusiasts similar to myself. First up, what's inside the card? Now, you would have heard this many times before, so I'll just make this bit brief. The card boasts the new GP104 16nm FinFET Pascal architecture. This shrink in die size should, in theory, mean an increase in GPU efficiency, less heat output, and also a decrease in overall energy output. Now, this card features a 180 watt TDP with a 5 plus 1 power phase, and so Nvidia recommends you have at least a 500 watt power supply. Inside the 1080 are 2560 cooler cores, 8GB of GDDR5X VRAM, which runs on a 256 memory bus at 10 gigabits per second, and with a 320 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth. Crazy, right? Not quite as fast as HBM, which we saw in the R9 Fury X, but still very fast nonetheless. At stock, the Founders Edition GTX 1080 pumps out a core clock of 1607 MHz, a boost clock of 1733, although mine did go higher up to 1860 due to GPU Boost 3.0, and an effective memory clock of 10,000 MHz, all of which gives a nice old 9 teraflops of performance. I don't know about you, but so far so good, right? Now let's move on to the actual aesthetics of the card. The industrial sharp edge design gives this card a much needed refinement in the cooler design which has been kept the same since 2012. Although they still have kept that nice green illuminated GeForce GTX logo which we all know and love. The GTX 1080 features a vapor chamber cooling technique which should keep temperatures at bay while you squander through your daily gaming sessions be it Squad, Battlefield 1 or Star Citizen. Although I don't have a sound recording kit to tell you the exact noise levels of the cooler, I can say fans were inaudible until they got to around 70% fan speed. I have this card installed in the NZXT H440 by the way, which does have some sound dampening foam. As for temperatures of the cooler, the car did get up to a maximum of 87 degrees Celsius, but I will take note that it is summer and my room being small and at the top of the house does get rather hot, with what I can assume would be around 25 to 26 degrees Celsius, maybe even more. At idle, the temperature averaged around 55 degrees C, and if you are thinking this is a bit high, then you'd probably be right. The reason for the high idle temps are the fact that I have a dual monitor setup. It forces the card to run at its base clock of 1607MHz and not at the lowered 600MHz if you had a single monitor setup. I realised this and once remedied, the card idled at around 36 degrees Celsius. This also lowered the load temperatures from 87 degrees Celsius to around 84 degrees Celsius, so I thought it was worth mentioning. There is a fix for this issue, forcing a low power state, even with multi-monitor setups, but I would like to see an implementation of the fix in one of Nvidia's later driver updates. As a lot of people run multi-monitor setups these days, not just those who are ed into editing and enthusiast gaming. It seems strange Nvidia include multiple outputs on the back of the card for multiple displays to be connected, yet does not offer a fix in place to decrease heat and thus increase the longevity of the card. And, talking of the outputs on the back, the card has support for one HDMI 2.0, a DVI, and three DisplayPort 1.4, which are capable of displaying 4K at 120Hz or 8K at 60Hz, another fantastic feature of the card. The final thing to this card, other than the simple but welcomed backplate for added security and rigidity, is the single 8-pin power connector which will supply the card with adequate sustenance. And so, that's all the boring stuff out of the way, how does it game? 
good question, but before I get into showing you a bunch of numbers to tickle your winky, I would like to make another note on the fact that I did do a tutorial on how to increase FPS in all games, and that video brought my FPS up a fair bit. But, for the video's purposes, I will not be showing the results affected by those tips. If you wish to see this card at its full potential after those video tips are enabled, click on this video here and go to the results. The link will also be in the video description. This video will be about stock performance. That being said, let's get into the benchmarks. All these games are tested at ultra settings 1440p. If you would like to know the performance of a certain game, then please do tell me in the comments below. So the card performs very well, but what about overclocking? Overclocking was brilliant on this card, if it wasn't for GPU Boost 3.0, and the massive throttling that occurs after just a few minutes of use. I managed to add 188MHz to the core which brought the clock speed up to about 2088MHz after boost, and an extra 300MHz to the memory which brought the memory clock up to 10600MHz effective. I also brought the power limit up to 120% which mostly fixed the throttling issues at stock speeds which were so bad that they literally dropped down to the base clock frequency after a mere 15 minutes of playing. Any more than 2088MHz on the core and the card outright refused to run any games and they crashed immediately. But honestly, any more than 2088MHz on the core and the card outright refused to run any games and they crashed immediately, but 2088MHz was as stable as a hammered in doornail. I don't know why, I just couldn't achieve 2100MHz, and even this overclock had problems. After about 10 minutes the card's core dropped down to around 1830MHz, at which it would just hang there. Honestly, you may achieve better performance by just adding around 50 MHz to the core clock, pushing the memory as high as it can, some people have easily added a further 500 MHz onto that, and then increasing the power limit to 120% and introducing a custom fan curve to minimise or remove that infernal throttling that seems to plague this card. After that, you should get a very decent performance boost. As a final verdict, I would recommend against the GTX 1080 Founders Edition, unless you're going to use it for an SLI rig, hate waiting for the aftermarket cards, like myself, or really like the design of the card, which is admittedly very striking. I recommend you instead go and buy yourself an aftermarket version, which we should be seeing more supply for within the next month or so. These cards are cheaper, cooler, quieter, and in many cases faster. On top of that, they may have more room for overclocking, although at the moment it seems to be the same story with all the 1080s, regardless of whether or not it's a third-party design. 
That being said, I can wholeheartedly recommend the GTX 1080 as an overall GPU. The added 20 FPS or so each game over the 90 Ti is pleasant, and would be even more so if you're upgrading from a mid-range card like a GTX 960 or R9 380. If you can afford it, go for it, because it is the single fastest GPU on the market to date. But that brings our review to a close. If you did like it, then do show your appreciation by tapping that like button. I love your face, and I will see you guys in the next one. Terra.